remembering Connecticut, the Amistad affair. The New York Globe, August 1839. The pilot boat Blossom on Wednesday last fell in with a schooner having on board 25 or 30 men, all blacks, who requested something to eat and drink. There were no persons on board that could speak English, and they appeared to be well supplied with cutlasses, but what their intentions were could not be understood. The mysterious schooner was soon captured by the Coast Guard brig Washington. It turned out to be the Amistad, a Spanish ship headed for a Cuban port with a cargo of recently captured Africans who had been held crouching in chains below the decks. The Africans managed to undo their chains. They killed the captain and the cook and seized the ship. The Coast Guard towed the Amistad to New London where the Africans were indicted for murder and piracy and packed off to jail in New Haven. Spain demanded the return of ship and cargo, the human cargo included. Slavery was of course legal in much of the United States at that time, and an opinion by the United States Attorney General declared that the Africans were property, like any other cargo, and should be handed over to whoever could prove right of ownership. But not everyone saw the Africans simply as property. Ministers from the Yale Divinity School, though not necessarily advocates of abolishing slavery, saw the Amistad's arrival as a heaven-sent opportunity to Christianize Africans. One New Haven minister, Dr. Josiah Willard Gibbs, learned from the Africans how to count in Mendy, their language, then walked the docks of New York, counting out loud until he found a Mendy sailor who could translate for the captives. Divinity students spent six hours a day teaching them English and Protestantism. Another group, the anti-slavery activists, saw the case as a dramatic opportunity to free slaves from bondage. They organized the Amistad Committee to defend the Africans' human rights. Prominent Connecticut lawyers, including Roger Baldwin, son of a Connecticut governor, and Seth Staples, future founder of the Yale Law School, volunteered to represent the captives in court. They wrote President Martin Van Buren, It is a question that we pray may not be decided in the recesses of the cabinet, where these unfriended men can have no counsel and can produce no proof, but in the halls of justice, with the safeguards that she throws around the unfriended and oppressed. It was John Quincy Adams, former president and a preeminent elder statesman of the Republic, who agreed to represent the Africans before the Supreme Court. These men were found free, and they cannot now be decreed to be slaves, but by making them slaves. By what authority will this court undertake to do this? While it did not question the legality of slavery in the United States, the Supreme Court ruled that the Amistad captives were kidnapped Africans, who by the laws of Spain itself were entitled to their freedom. The Amistad Committee displayed the now liberated Africans as curiosities in city after city to demonstrate their mastery of English, Protestantism, and hymn singing. The money raised by these performances was used to hire a ship to take them back to Africa, accompanied by American missionaries who hoped to use them to Christianize other Africans. When, on their departure, the Africans presented John Quincy Adams with a Bible, he wrote them in reply, It was from this book I learned to espouse your cause when you were in trouble, and to give thanks to God for your deliverance. <laughs>